Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Darlene McLennan. I'm the manager of the Australian Disability Clearinghouse of Education and Training, and I'd like you to welcome to you welcome you to this webinar, which is on collaboration for improved career and development decisions for students with mental health conditions. Firstly, before I start, I would like to pay respect to the traditional owners, um, traditional and original custodians of the land um, where I am today, the Palawa people, and pay respect for, to the elders past and present and emerging. And I would also like to acknowledge the Tasmanian Aboriginal community who continue to maintain their identity, culture and Aboriginal rights. Um, it's great pleasure um, to host Jul Julie um, Rogan um, from Griffith University um, to present this webinar today. Julie might be a bit rattled like I am because we've been running around for the last half an hour um, trying to, to um, troubleshoot some, um, some issues in the background. Julie's going to discuss with us um, uh, the way that Griffiths has actually collaborated to support students with disabilities and mental health um, to improve their employment outcomes. Um, for those who have, um, this is the first time you're joining us, we do have this um, event um, captioned. If you'd like to access the captions, um, you can actually click on the caption um, uh, caption button which is in the toolbar which is either located at the top or bottom of your screen. You can also increase the number of lines appearing in the caption box by cl clicking on the small arrow in the top right hand side of the caption bo um, box. If you have any technology issue, technological issues or difficulties please contact us or don't because we're having them as well. <laughs> no, you can contact us at admin at adset.edu au. Julie said she's probably going to talk for around 40 or 50 minutes um, and then we'll have some questions at the end. So we encourage you to actually um, put your questions into the chat pod or the question pod at any time through the presentation and then I'll ask them at the end. You have a choice there to actually click on um, just a panellist or to panellists and all, um, all participants. So if you want to kind of have a conversation between each other. Um, which has been great because sometimes people answer um, questions before we even get to them. Mm. So now I'm going to hand over to, to Julie. Thank you for your patience with us today, Julie, with our technology issues. And, um, yeah, we look forward to hearing your presentation. So over to you. Thank you so much, Darlene, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. And I just... Just as a bit of a start, as um, the title suggests, I'm a great advocate for career development and I think it's especially crucial for students with disabilities or any type of health condition or injury to really have some good career development knowledge. Now, it doesn't, it's particularly in this day and age, I don't think it actually needs to be so much what am I going to do because three years or four years at university is a long time to, to make decisions, to see different things happening and to have a look at what's available. So, it, but it is about how to make that decision how to understand who they are and how to understand the job market, which I'm sure you all agree has changed a lot over the last 10 years. And we continue to hear about this change. But I think the most um, that we can ask for is that students understand what they need to ask at the stage when they come in. And I've often said to students, back in my career days or as a disability advisor is about you know where they're going to go what helped them to reach their decision and have they made any decision so i wanted to go straight into two case studies at the start and we'll come back to those during the presentation but um, first of all, we've got student number one, first year of nursing, and trimester two has just completed a placement. She's been referred by the School of Nursing and Midwifery Placement Coordinator 
presented with depression, generalized anxiety disorder. The triggers are stress, lack of sleep, seasonal. So definitely she described she's worse on dark, dreary days or during the night. Now the impact for her, she explained, is being on her own for a lengthy period of time, making poor decisions, difficulty speaking to people, absolutely needs eight to 10 hours sleep per night. And her medication means that she couldn't sleep during the day. The placement coordinator was concerned when we spoke. Although this placement went well, he said warning bells were ringing as the student had written on her placement form that she could never do night shift. And that's what um, she also said to me in the registration. Now, I presume people may be surprised at that or maybe not surprised that um, this young lady had got to trimester two of her, her first year of nursing and hadn't occurred to her that she would have to probably do some night shift, at least in her placement during her studies, but more than likely as a graduate um, in a hospital setting where uh, most graduates do um, some of their first year. Now, if we can just leave you thinking about that and go on to student two. Student two had completed an undergraduate uh, degree in IT. He had yet to enroll in his master's to be a secondary school teacher, but was thinking about it and wanted to see what sort of help he could get from disabilities um, assistance and reasonable adjustments with, um, with his condition. All his family were teachers. He felt that teaching was something that he knew about because it was talked about at home a lot and some a necessary thing where he could take his IT degree into so he referred himself, he presented with social anxiety, performance phobia, PTSD and Asperger's. His triggers were speaking to groups of people, no structure, panic attacks when he feels threatened or singled out. And the impact for him was not being able to complete tasks if they weren't well structured panics when someone asks him a question. He explained that he profusely sweats and sometimes has panic attacks if required to present to any group. So again, I'm wondering if that's already um, setting off alarm bells with people or they've, they've heard about it. Again, he, this um, young man thought he knew about teaching. He'd heard lots of talk around the family dinner table. He'd seen his mother's and father um, marking, doing other preparation for school, and he thought he could handle that. And obviously, without going into it too much further at this stage, he hadn't been to a classroom. It didn't occur to him that getting up and talking to teenagers in a high school would be like a presentation. And that obviously people, when you're working with people, high school students, teenagers, um, it's not always structured. You can't plan something and know it will definitely turn out. Obviously, his subject choice of IT made that a bit easier um, because of the prescriptive nature. But anyhow, let's um, just move on. If you can think about those two um, 
those two case study, hold those thoughts. We'll keep coming back to the case study, um, but neither of those students had had any career advice or even much of a career conversation with anybody. And so I'm asking, would it have made a difference? Knowing what you know of the case studies, would it have made a difference? Now this is where I guess a webinar differs from, um, from speaking to people in person where I might have got some, um, some replies back already. So please write down or think about those. Well, Julie, it's Darlene here. So people can use the chat box if they'd like, yeah. um, just to kind of put their thoughts in, in place. Yeah. Um, sorry, we probably should have actually set a poll up. So, um, but if people want to say, in the chat box, do you think it would have made a difference if the, the um, student, those students had an opportunity to um, receive career advice? Do you want to keep? Thanks. Thanks, Julie. Oh, thank you. So let's go on <clears throat> a bit and think. I just wanted to think about how important is the career conversation. And certainly as a team at Griffith, we've been discussing this lately and how much as a DSO, disability advisor, disability consultant, what, whatever you may be called, how important is it for us um, as someone that the student may know quite well over their three years. So thinking about the fact that we know um, anecdotally and through research that many students haven't had a lot of career guidance or career development in schools. And when you talk to many um, guidance officers, career uh, practitioners in schools, uh, particularly guidance officers in public schools are, are just so incredibly busy with social and emotional issues with students that they feel uh, when talking to a lot of them that they're really only giving out information. So they're giving out information that a student has asked for, not necessarily discussing what they may want to do. And does the student know anything about the industry that they may go into from doing this degree? How aware are they of their condition? and its impact on the type of work that they may have. And I guess often um, we say, I hear colleagues say, and, and parents say, if you like, you know, anybody can do anything. With any disability, you should be able to do anything. And I'm not saying you can't do anything or someone can't do anything, but there can be restrictions depending on some disabilities. And so all I want to know is that a student is well informed of what they might be. And, and I can think of quite a few examples, but we had a student um, with cerebral palsy in a chair who enrolled and studied for a year in uh, medical laboratory science as, and he was pretty sure that's what he wanted to do. We, um, because of going into labs and, and the health and safety um, issues around that, there was a lot of discussion. He was a very, very independent young man. He really wanted to come to university without any help. It was his mother who decided that he should make an appointment and register with disability services. So he was quite surprised at the issues um, around in the lab, uh, health and safety, keeping things um, germ free, I guess. And also because of um, issues with his hands and fingers and his fine motor skills, things like using a microscope 
where this young man thought, oh, there'll be plenty of people around to help, you know, that won't be an issue or I won't have to do that very often. Well, he quickly learned with hearing our meetings with academics, which he was involved in, and then actually being in labs, just how much help he would need. Obviously, we put lots of things in place for him. I, pretty much against his will because he wanted to do it on his own. But he said the first thing he came across was he realised he couldn't put a lab coat on. And also they couldn't take their bags into the lab and he wasn't able to take his bag off his wheelchair by himself. So already a few issues right at the start. Unfortunately, um, even with the best of our attention, intentions and abilities, we just couldn't make this work very well or as well as he wanted. And um, after trimester two, he came in for an interview with my colleague and myself and said, apart from the fact he hadn't done very well, it wasn't at all what he thought it would be. And while he had talked um, at some length to some people in the industry and, and found out there would be able to be some help for him in a lab, as in um, having another staff member or someone come in and help him with the things he couldn't do, he was very independent and he didn't want that. So that's when he, he thought, I'm, I need to change. This is not what I want to do now that I've found out what it's about. And he had had a miserable year by the end of it. So again, that leads to the next question is how resourceful and resilient um, are the students to put in new strategies or strategies that will help them get to be where they want to. And resilience is really important. Um, as far as I've noticed with some students coming into uni, their parents have been a resilient one up until then. And so it's a big shock, not only going into a course of study they thought they wanted to do, but also realising the difficulties. And unfortunately, sometimes the throwback from academic staff who, um, whether it's right or not, had to do more work than sometimes uh, they felt they should. I guess another good question is what's the purpose of study? Uh, maybe only solely for interest and means to another end. Obviously that can also still have difficulties because in the course there might be practical placements, internships, sorts of things um, that they have to study to get their degree, but, but sometimes it's not. So a student wants to go through and do they actually want a career as, as an analyst? Uh, when they get through, maybe they do, or maybe they just want the degree. You probably all, like us, had some terminal patients who are just doing the degree because they want to have that piece of paper. Now, when we think of the DSO, how much do we how, do we know about the world of work? And if we don't, which is fine, because I'm sure you all think you've got enough to do as it is, do we collaborate with the careers team? How strong is our relationship with, with the student, which there's a lot of research shows that uh, the disability advisor the, or support staff will in fact have the best, biggest relationship out of any student services staff. So that person may well be who the student wants to speak to. And have we got strong relationships internally and externally that we can call upon when we need to, and, and this comes again to um, the title talking about mental health issues, because 
there's a lot of help out there in the community. Which brings me on to the next slide. And I'm sorry if you're seeing all the notes to the side that might have been part of our technical issues. At this stage, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Griffith and please note that these are 2017 statistics. So there has been a changes since then, but we um, had 47,260 students, 4,489 full-time staff, over at that time, five campuses. Now that's changed um, to six campuses and our online students are now our sixth campus. In 2016, about 5% of enrolments were students with disability. Uh, and about 50% of those registered for support. Uh, we offer appointments through the calendar year, up to 45 minutes face-to-face, -face, phone. Um, we often chat over emails or Skype. We presented orientations on invitation by the academic schools. Uh, this, we hope, is growing because it's great to get in there and, and talk about, I think, a really important thing, being called a disability service, just what it does cover. Because I'm sure, like me, you've had many students who don't think they've got a disability and they haven't. They've got a condition which impacts on their study. So we try to shout that loud and proud from the rooftops. But orientations is often the best way to do it. And obviously we get um, an influx of students after those orientations, a lot with mental health issues who are incredibly relieved that they can get some support. We collaborate with academics uh, and the academic schools. Often, often obviously, this um, collaboration is what leads to us being able to present to orientations. We collaborate with other student services teams, like student welfare, careers, counselling. And I, I suppose, in a way, my title um, about careers, I think, because careers is, is, you know, the whole part of your life that it doesn't actually only refer to the job, it refers to the whole life where counselling and psychologists come into it. And on the, on the Gold Coast, um, we've started having a meeting once a week or trying to set it up, whereas many of us can meet for coffee first thing in the morning, which um, is a great way to get other staff there, of course, having um, a nice warm coffee, particularly at this time of year. There, um, with students' permission, we have talked about students we have in common, but we also talk about what's happening with that team, new things that are happening, how we can help each other, and, and how we can collaborate better to make a better journey for the student. And I just know from my own collaboration on campuses, um, including now mental health nurses um, and much more that I have no doubt it makes the student experience much better and, um, and more successful for the student. We also have relationships with outside agencies like Headspace, um, external psychologists, hospital mental health teams. Um, we attend when we can interagency meetings and, and, and try to um, meet up with TAFE staff as well. We offer disability awareness training to other staff. And as I was saying, the student case meetings um, 
that we are already having amongst our own teams, but also with academic staff as and when we can. Two other programs at Griffith that have been really helpful at with our students um, looking at work, careers and part-time work. And there is also a lot of study and I'm happy to send information to anybody who wants it, how important um, trying things out is for students with disabilities more than many other cohorts. If they can have a go, go to the physical place and so this can happen through uni temps and they are paid placements which are on campus or around South East Queensland businesses. It's a bit like a, a recruitment agency but um, uni temps Griffith offer the flexibility of work assignments from casual to full-time roles and everything in between. So this has been great. Again, we are collaborating a lot with the uni temps who come under our career service and advising and each other really and in information about what the student's looking at. And we've also, um, which I'm sure a lot of people already know about and some of the universities have it, is the University Specialist Employment Partnerships which um, is a trial local on-campus employment service that's been developed with and for graduates with a disability in Australia with the idea of improving rates of employment for students after university. For us, it's a collaboration between Griffith University and Milestones Disability Employment Service as well as the National Disability Coordination Officer Program. So that has been great again because usually students have to wait until they've completed study to um, connect with a disability employment service, a DES, and this way we have someone coming in twice a week to campus from Milestones to work with students in their third year. And I suppose it brings about another point as well of what we've been finding is that if students wait till that third year, their graduation year, if that's it, they're often realising then when they get down to the discussion about employment that perhaps they haven't chosen as well as they could have. So I think, again, importantly, is referring or discussing their career aspiration early on can really help in a student's journey. Okay. So I just wanted to make it a clear again, because I would hate um, anyone to think that we would say it's not possible to study that course. But I guess it's students understanding the inherent requirements of the course, what our reasonable adjustments can do. But also, it's not only us, how are they going to make it possible? How are they going to learn what they need to know. So our office is, is thinking about questions that we can add to our registration just to alert us to if students have an idea of what they're going to do, have an idea of, you know, the job market. Is that going to fit in the job market or the aspects of the job? and can they, with their disability, manage them how they want, if they want to be independent. And being in my years as a careers advisor, I found not only with students with disabilities, but any student, but that when we talk about aspects of work, so they may have decided, yes, I like blood and gooey things, so 
I really wanted to get into some sort of medical or science or science thing, but have they thought of other aspects of that work? Have they thought that they might, as a scientist, um, just be a clog? So people who want to have a start in an ending, for instance, um, so know a project from start to end and realise that in their part, they will never know the outcome of something. It might be years away. And believe it or not, these are these can really make or break a person in a job for us living in Brisbane. If it's something that a student or anybody looking at a career transition, I don't want to shift away from Brisbane or I can't. Well, that job isn't available in Brisbane. So everybody, I guess the point I'm making has to think about aspects of a career in the career they've chosen so that they can see what's available, see the aspects and make sure that they want to do those things. So I would suggest researching into the sector, um, talking to people, asking questions. And I think that's really important to start that right at the start of their study even if at that stage they're only asking academics or other students um, who may be further along from them. So considering the impact of their condition on their choice of career and strategies to overcome those difficulties. So how, how am I going to get around that? Like I was talking about my young man or our young man in med lab science. He chose that he didn't want to overcome those. He wanted to change to a career where he could be independent. And he, as little as possible, had to rely on somebody else. Now, again, I'm not suggesting we become the career advisor, but those alerts might be a good time to refer to careers. And so building that relationship with the careers team is is really important. We have found here on the Gold Coast that um, we have lots of questions for each other about courses and um, they come into us when the students come to them to ask questions about their condition and we might be asking them questions about various courses, prerequisites, all those sort of things. So as I said, and I did write this um, for Pathways last year, and I'm embarrassed to say that I believe I was tasked with developing those simple questions. So um, I haven't done that yet, but any suggestions or ideas that others have, I would love to hear. So the questions we have to consider and um, actually, I'm just going to take you back now to that um, the case studies of those students and just tell you what happened with this, those students. As I mentioned, um, this young lady, it didn't occur to her that night shift or different shifts or being out of her her normal patterns would happen as a nurse. So she spent quite some time with career practitioners um, understanding and developing a plan for her career and actually decided uh, with the support of counsellors at uni and her own medical team to continue her her nursing studies with the idea that she would either continue her studies and go into research or see if she could find work in a medical practice from nine till five. So that was fine. And again, it was just about 
her research, researching and understanding and then putting some strategies in place to manage the placements she would have. And as I said, that included her own medical team and also um, counsellors and disability services on campus. Student number two. So this young man, as I said, um, thought he knew all about teaching from his parents. So when he went to careers, they organised him uh, to go out to have a look at a local high school. And he, after half an hour, said he was absolutely sure that he did not want to be a teacher. And again, I suppose I, to some degree, thought he would he would have made that connection about having to present, if you would, in front of students, but he hadn't at all. He'd seen his parents marking and he'd seen um, them talking and planning things and he thought, I can handle that. So shock horror when he got in and, and watched. And also um, I'm told in a class where the students were a little bit difficult. So um, his structure, as he said, would go out the window. So he decided to do some postgrad continuing in an IT area, which really suited his personality and condition, but certainly nothing where he would be having to present to others. As he said, he wanted to be in the back room, not front and centre. So they were two quite different, but really good outcomes once those students went into um, to really have a look at their at, at their options and their choices. So I just wanted to leave you with some some questions to consider around careers and mainly students with mental health, but I'm sure you agree it, it can cover any students um, and their challenges with other conditions as well. And how do we make that time? Because I'm talking about adding to a very full registration if people have, have got a lot of adjustments need to be made already and also being um, able to to collaborate closely with careers and, and then counselling and others and, and the questions of how do we know what to ask we don't know about careers I mean I'm, I'm sure a lot of you do but if we don't, do we need to know more or is it enough to refer and make sure the students uh, are getting the knowledge they need? And how do we make it easier for the students? Do we, I know, uh, for instance, for some students that I've referred to careers, I've suggested that they have a checklist of things to research and understand, or if it's possible, can get out and see where they may want to work in the sector and really find out firsthand what would they be like. And I guess, how do we make it easy? easier for the DSO? How do we make it easier for ourselves when we've got so many other things to cover but in the end, I, I feel, and as I've seen it happen, when students come to us, I guess is the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff because things have fallen over from, from choices of career they've made. And is it easier if we put those things in place early on, have that career discussion, lead them in the right direction, and make sure that they're making good choices for the whole of their body and soul. 
And that brings me to the ends. Great. Thank you. Wonderful, Julie. I mean, I just think, you know, you've um, asked some really great questions. And I think that questions of ethics, you know, the ethics around, you know, people, you know, not having those good career conversations prior to starting with the cost of, um, you know, our degrees these days. Yes. Can be a costly expense. I think one of our um, one of the people on the chat box kind of identified that as well. If people have questions, um, they can put it into the chat box, or we're actually going to try because we've only we've got a small number today. We're going to try if you want to put your hand up, we could and you have a, um, a headset, we could actually even get you to ask the questions instead of me. Um, so thank you for everybody commenting on some of Julie's questions. Um, Somebody's asked, are school liaison teams for running disability services enough? So I suppose that's your recruitment teams and so forth. Do you think, you know, people having those discussions around the impact of their disability prior to starting universities or, or um, TAFE, do you think those conversations are happening, Julie? Uh, you know, don't start me, to <laughs> I mean, It's one of, certainly one of um, my bandwagons is, that no, they're not. And how do we prepare school students for not only career choices at university, but for university? And from what I understand, while we've got some really good programs at Griffith, they're certainly not tailored to students with disabilities. I would love to be able to get out to schools, and if not, to to at least have more discussion with disability or career staff at the schools over what sort of things to talk to the students about. We've kind of thrown lots of things around of how to manage that with limited time, um, but haven't had much success in involving other teams that are already going out to schools. Yeah. Okay. Um, just going back to the the case study where the student was um, nursing, how did you go around making the adjustments to the placement? Like the fact that, you know, majority, often placements within nursing, you have to go across the, the gamut of, of placements, including, um, you know, like if, you know, the night shift and so forth. How did, how did um, the negotiation go with the faculty around that or the school? Okay, good question. So, um I think after going through the course profile, like it was absolutely listed as an inherent requirement to cover the gamut of shifts. So we managed to, for the student to have a uh, much shorter nighttime placement. Um, during that time, it was quite a rigmarole for everybody really because she had to, um, her medical team off campus needed to adjust her medication and she was debriefing for those, I think she did ended up doing four days night shift. Um, she spoke to a counsellor after each of those night shifts uh, because the biggest concern was it going into a major depressive episode. Mm. which I, I think, and I'm um, certainly um, not the person that, not an expert, but I think that many more, and she would have, it would have become really difficult. And I think it was four days and she had two day, uh, a day off in the middle, so a night off, if you like, in the middle. Yeah, it's even an interesting thing, though, to think that that's inherent, isn't it? It's, um, yeah, yeah, it's quite well, interesting. It'd be nice to want to test in law, really. If, yeah, well, we uh, did, um, I, I suppose, in the end, because I, we certainly questioned that as an inherent requirement, um, like others, if they're actually ever going to work doing mm. that, but... Um, the student actually pulled the plug on um, not, you know, she wanted to go ahead. She felt that she might be disadvantaged in other ways if she didn't um, 
agree to do some. Okay. Yeah, no, very interesting. All right, if there were just one final chance if anybody's got any other questions. Um, we had a, a couple of questions prior, um, but they weren't kind of related to the topic. You you were aware of those, Julie, around um, those questions around students of parents with intellectual disability. I don't know if you've got any experience with that at all. Or... Yeah, sorry, could you, because um, I haven't, I, my screen isn't showing any. So it was, it was students of parents with an intellectual disability. I don't quite know what the question was related to. Um, okay, I, um, look, and I'll just take it from what I, from my experience, um, I think with, with an intellectual, because we, um, and I should have mentioned this before, but we, it's not really big enough. We do run a tertiary experience day where students with a disability can come on campus. Right. Um, they go to one of our campuses and um, we have talks and different things. They can have a look at the um, assistive technology and what have you. However, I think at most we can take 30 to 40 students. So as you can imagine, with the number of students we've got, that doesn't cover many, but um, we have had students, particularly um, in, in the arts schools, where um, students may be very good, they've got intellectual disabilities, but they may be excellent in, um, in painting and drawing, or um, doing moulding or any of those things. But what the difficulty was, um, with students, and we, I think in the end we had about three all up who, who I think didn't realise that at university there has to be theory. So for each of these students with intellectual disabilities, their um, writing skills and comprehension skills were um, not at a tertiary level and probably never would be. However, the parents were hoping that they could do the practical part, but no theory. Yep. And unfortunately, you know, there just there has to be that hard discussion at that stage about perhaps different types of courses. Mm. Yeah, no, they're, they're, it's kind of quite challenging. Um, so, no one else has asked any other questions. So what we might do is um, I'll just want to thank you, Julie, for your time. It was great to, and some really f great food for thought there for all of us. I think um, we might be able to keep the conversation going on Ofsted um, and hopefully we'll, um, yeah, um, we might even chat to you about the, your outcomes of pathways and how we can support you to, to do those. Just a quick um, plug for our next um, uh, webinar. It's on ECHO 360. Um, there's been a bit of discussion around um, the new automatic, um, automat automatic, no, I can't even say it, automated, that's it, speech recognition um, that's coming on. I think that's been a, a, on a hot topic this week on the, the list serve that we have. So um, in your chat pod, there's a link to provide more information on that. Um, and also uh, we'll ask at the end of this um, to fill in a survey. And as part of that survey, we're also keen to hear other topics that you might like as um, and future webinars that we can organise with people. So um, please fill in the survey um, and provide further advice. So, um, and also the survey link is in the um, chat panel as well. So once again, Julie, thank you. And thank you for um, everybody else who attended. And thank you to the captioner today. Have a great week, everybody. Yeah. It's only Monday. It's got to get better, Julie. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, take care, everybody. You too. Bye-bye.